It's the sound of ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Anna Huntsman in today for Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for joining us. A compelling documentary produced by Ideastream Public Media aired this week on WVIZ PBS that features the winners of the 88th annual Annisfield Wolf Book Awards, the only American book prize focusing on works that address racism and diversity. Ideastream reporter Gabriel Kramer, along with producer Natalia Garcia, spent a good chunk of 2023 traveling around the country to produce the documentary, from Iowa to Massachusetts to New Hampshire, and even here in Ohio to get to know these acclaimed writers. The documentary was hosted by Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., who has served as the Book Awards Committee Chair for the past 27 years. It premiered Monday night to PBS stations nationwide, but you'll get another chance to watch it tonight at 8 on WVIZ PBS, or you can stream it online on Ideastream's website and on PBS Passport. We're going to start today's show by talking to Gabriel Kramer about lessons learned from meeting these writers and from the documentary process as a whole. He joins me in studio now. Thanks so much for coming in, Gabe. Good morning. And later this hour, we'll discuss how local organizations are addressing food insecurity in Stark County. But first, if you'd like to ask questions about the documentary process or the award winners, you can call us 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Okay, Gabe. So not only is this award local, which I don't know if you want to talk about the Cleveland aspect here, but it's a big deal in the literary world, right? Well, it definitely is. It's not the biggest uh, literary prize, but it is a national prize. Right. While it's based here in Cleveland, it's not for locals. And the jury isn't local either. The, the jury is all over the country, most recently chaired by Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., who is stepping down, uh, mm. and they'll have a new jury in 2024. But it's it's the only book prize in the country, as you mentioned, that is dedicated to authors who f- dedicate their career to issues of racism and diversity. So to be honored for that, to be recognized of your intention is, is certainly uh, quite an honor. And, you know, to know that you're up against authors from the entire country, just like you would with any other book prize, a Pulitzer or whatever it may be. Certainly, that's got to feel good as as a literary light. So what was that like then, sitting down with all of these great writers who, as you mentioned, won a very competitive prize? This is your second time producing the documentary. Correct. So what's your process like? Well, it's funny because these are people who are a huge deal yeah. in their worlds. Like they are, they're award winning. They're amongst the best. But when you meet them... And you get to talk to them and you go to their homes and you set up this camera and you're sitting down with lights and cameras. You get to imagine that the lights and cameras aren't there. You're sitting down in their homes, just like having a cup of coffee, drinking over a beer. So they really became very friendly. While they are a big deal, they, they are they are just, uh, you know, it's like getting an opportunity to just get to know them on a personal level. And hopefully that comes through on screen for people who get to watch it. Do you have any, I don't know, specific memories of just someone who, I don't know, were you starstruck at all? Well, you know, it's 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 funny because, you know, let's say, you know, Saeed Jones is one of the authors that we talk about. And he's the first one you'll meet in the documentary. He lives just down the street in Columbus. Mm. And he, you know, he's got this really cool outfit on, this green jumpsuit. And it's, to me, it's just, it's fashionable and it's cool. And I'm thinking, man, this guy's, this guy's got some star power to him. He's, he's someone that people rely on for social commentary. And I asked, I said, hey, man, that's a, that's one, that's a great outfit you got on. He said, I'm, I just threw it on. You know, that's, that's kind of who he is. You know, he's just, he's just really cool. And, you know, things that are a big deal to a lot of us or might, we might think of as, you know, extra cool. It's just, that's his, that's his life. Yeah, he his personality really shines through in the documentary. But before we even get to him, let's talk about just the winners in general and, you know, what it was like meeting them. Let's talk about Geraldine Brooks. So she won the Fiction Award for her novel Horse. You went to Martha's Vineyard for this one. Yes, Geraldine Brooks is one of two fiction winners this year for her okay. book Horse. And while it's a book of fiction, she relies on a very real history of one of the most dominant race horses in the history of the sport. And this is a horse that was groomed, raised, and jockeyed by black enslaved Americans in the 18th century. So she, this is a very real racehorse. And she talks about the history a little bit where 
this racehorse was so good and people came in droves to see this horse race that they mass produced stopwatches for people to kind of time the horse in the stands. That was like the first time in American history where people were really having the ability to do what they would do. You know, today we can go to any race and do it on our phones, but it, it's really neat to hear how good this horse was and the history of this horse that, you know, essentially any successful racehorse or a lot of successful racehorses today are descendants of this one horse. So mm. she focuses on the people who raised and groomed and jockeyed this horse, the black enslaved Americans, and kind of creates this storyline of uh, drama that uh, ensues for the people who raised it. And what's really neat is this book has what she calls a triple braided storyline. So she has three different timelines, the 18th century, she has the 1950s, and she has today, well, 2019, and uh, how all these different eras or periods or people in those eras or periods have some kind of attachment to that horse. Yeah. Where did she get the idea for that? Well, I mean, she she's a horse lover herself. Okay. I mean, she I mean, she described herself as horse obsessed. Those are her words. <gasps> Not mine. Does and she have I, one? She has a horse named Valentine. When we showed up to uh, her home and we're on Martha's Vineyard, we got to hang out with Valentine for a little bit and, and watch her groom the horse and walk around her her yard with the horse. It was it was really pretty neat. But because of that, she was. She just has this fascination with horses when she was having dinner with some pals and someone brought up this history of this horse and this horse um the bones of the horse were in a museum and she learned about while they were sitting in storage and someone wanting to put them up into another museum and she just got fascinated by it and started digging and digging and decided let's write a story around mm. this history well in the documentary i know she talks about the criticism uh, that she received a little bit, which is that she shouldn't write about um, black lives because she's a white woman. Right. So, yeah, I've been talking a lot about this horse, but really the story is about the people who raised and groomed it and the life of an enslaved black person, which includes being separated from family, which be includes being sold from owner to owner and being treated with less respect than an animal or any other piece of property. And it's like any piece of work where they dig into the horrors of slavery, it's hard to take on. It's hard to mm. really, um, it, it's hard to fathom a lot of what you're reading. But, you know, sh she got a lot of criticism, particularly on the internet, as people criticize commonly on the internet, that, you know, as a white woman, a woman with privilege, a woman with wealth in a sense, to uh, be able to share that story. And people essentially, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but said, you know, this book comes off like a woman a white woman writing for white women. And mm. you know, I think her criticism, uh, she understands that. She understands her role, she understands who she is, and maybe doesn't have that exact perspective and doesn't know what it's like to be a black person in America. Well, we have America. a clip of what she, what she said, so let's hear that. There was kind of a main, I think it was intended to be a main review on Goodreads, which I don't go to, but somebody pointed it out to me, saying that the book read like a white woman writing for white women. Hmm. And I am absolutely fine with that because that's what an ally should be doing. Speak to the people who will listen to you. I don't have to tell a black person about the evils of slavery or the, the entrenchment of modern racism. They know it. They live it. Hmm. So she responds to that criticism by doubling down on being an ally, understanding that, look, I have I can take on a role in this way of speaking to the people who listen to me. If, if she's a white woman writing for a white woman, she's going to accept that, embrace it and say, look, I don't need to tell other black people what slavery was or what that history is. But if there are people who will listen to me, she can take on that role as an ally. And I think it's easy for people to appreciate that. Hmm. Well, let's talk about another winner for fiction, Lan Samantha Chang, who wrote The Family Chow. So for this, you travel to Iowa City, Iowa? Yes. Yeah, so Lan Samantha Chang is the director of the Iowa Writers Workshop. And for those who don't know, the Iowa Writers Workshop is the cream of the crop, the premier uh, English program in the United States at the graduate level, and it's based in the University of Iowa. Um, and, you know, the University of Iowa and Iowa City, it's a pretty neat place because it's a, you know, you, you think of the Midwest and you think of these farming towns and, um, you know, but this is a, a place where, you know, I think has really shown that it can be a breeding ground for these great artists and 
um, literary greats. Because last year, the 87th annual Annisfield Wolf of Book, Book, Book Records, the winner for poetry, Danica Kelly, was also working at the University of Iowa. So this is a town that really can produce some really great mm-hmm. writers. Lance Samantha Chang, while she didn't grow up in Iowa City, she grew up in Wisconsin. She lives there now, so I think Iowa can take some credit for uh, part of her success. And she wrote this book as that director. So, um, you know, I, I think... Obviously, she has the chops as the director of this workshop <laughs> to be a great writer, and it, and it shows through in The Family Chow. What is, I mean, you don't have to tell us the entire book, the whole plot, because obviously we want to encourage people to <laughs> sure. read. But uh, just give us a little bit about, what's it's about what it's about. Well, The Family Chow, it's a murder mystery. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's kind of neat and kind of interesting, but it's basically about a Chinese-American family in Wisconsin who um, owns this restaurant. And there's three uh, three sons, and they're now in their adult life. Um, and their two parents have separated. And kind of it shows how this book, or in this book, it shows how these three brothers are uniquely different. And it shows how uniquely different even the parents are. You got five people, and they're all so uniquely different in this Chinese-American family. Uh, eventually, um, you know, some trouble becomes afoot, and their father dies, and the whole town is wondering who did it. You know, mm. who, who, who's the culprit behind the um, the death of a father? Was it a murder? Was it on his own? Was it um, natural causes? What it may be. And what the book digs into is how unique this family might be and these different people may be, it also digs into how the outside people in this town view them. View them with a stereotyped gaze, view them in a way that uh, is perhaps unfair and they have predetermined notions of how these brothers are. And it's intentional for Lance Smith and Chang to write it this way because she wants to show the uniqueness of Chinese Americans and Asian Americans and people where in different types of media, books, literature, movies, it's often written in a very stereotyped way. So she wanted to reinforce the notion that Asian Americans, Chinese Americans are unique, are different and be she and should be viewed as such. Yeah, let's actually hear a clip from the documentary where Chang explains how she took the family drama and expanded it into social commentary. I wanted to show how that internal drama could be seen entirely differently, could be distorted, re-envisioned to serve the the purpose of other people's stories about how they thought Asian Americans should be or could be. There was so much that could be done with the gaze of the, the outsiders, the outside gaze upon this Asian American community and particularly this family that I hadn't envisioned when I started the book. The entire second half of the book became about that vision, that gaze. I just think it's so interesting when I hear authors talk about when they started a book thinking it would go one way and then as they write it, it becomes, you know, they add other things and it becomes something totally unexpected. Right. And she started writing this book uh, pre global COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. And one of the things that came with the COVID-19 pandemic is a lot of scapegoating and blaming Asian Americans for causing or creating this pandemic. And, uh, you know, it turned into violence, it turned into hatred, it turned into slurs being thrown at people. And, you know, she says that one thing that didn't change was um, this book always had a message of that experience can be very real because that experience didn't start when the pandemic started. That experience didn't start in March 2020. People getting hatred or scapegoated for being Asian American for some reason has existed, you know, since the immigration of Asians to America. So it was nice of her to kind of talk about that. Well, I did want to ask you, you've said that you relate to Chang because you also grew up as one of few Asian Americans in a predominantly white Midwest town. Did you talk about that with her at all. Oh, yeah. And that was really cool. So one of the cool things about meeting her is we actually got to meet her twice. So she uh, took a summer gig working at the Kenyon Review Workshop in Gambier, Ohio at, at Kenyon College. And she we, so we met her there earlier in the summer. And then two months later, we went to her home in Iowa. And, you know, both times we're just kind of chatting and talking about our life experiences. And, and, you know, even something as simple as a, a common piece of uh china or dishware that is common for asian american families to have she talks about it and i'm like man i had the same exact thing Mm -hmm. i mean and the big one was food i mean her book if you start reading her book you're going to finish the book kind of hungry because she talks about food (laughs) in such detail and it's so neat to to read about because she talks about the food from different cultures and 
growing up in the Midwest, you learn about while maybe at home you eat these, you know, Chinese American delicacies if you're Lance Samantha Chang or these Filipino American delicacies if you're my family. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of compare it to what your friends are eating. Because I, I remember being a kid and always wondering, what are my white friends eating at home? Like, what are, <laughs> if they're not eating adobo or machado or pancit, like, what is it that they're eating? So, like, you know, it's funny to have that conversation with her because it's part of her book where she talks about being fascinated and appreciative of what her, you know, um, white friends were eating and she puts in the book and it's kind of neat. And we talk about it in the documentary too. So I was going to say that must have been such an interesting experience talking oh, yeah. about that with her. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, I think one of the things, I mean, as you meet these people, of course you want to relate to them, but it was so much, it was so easy to relate to Lance Samantha Chang and I you know, appreciate her taking her time for me because it was really neat to see someone who, you know, is a, a generation above, but to have a similar experience and to kind of have a connection that way was really great. And then to see her story, which I can relate to being somewhat close to my story on paper in a published book that wins an award, is pretty great. And I would imagine that maybe some other people felt that way as well when the book came out. So. Absolutely. Well, we've talked about Massachusetts. We've gone to Iowa. Now let's go to New Hampshire to meet yes. the nonfiction winner, Matthew Delmont, who wrote Half American, the epic story of African-Americans fighting World War II at home and abroad. Yes, Matthew F. Delmont. A top of the line historian, Dartmouth College professor, and he writes this story about the involvement of black Americans in World War II, a storyline and a history that is very often just forgotten. And there are stories in the book where he talks about black World War II veterans going to bookshelves and bookstores or libraries, and they have this World War II section, World War II history section. And you would struggle to find a narrative of a story about the black people who were involved. And he digs in this history and he talks about people who were soldiers, people who worked in supply, people who worked in all these different ways. And what you find out is that not only were black people heavily involved, but they were successful. They were excellent at what they did. And this war for the American side essentially could not have been won without the involvement of black Americans. So really need to hear him, um, you know, bring that to life. So there's a lack of books showing this history. So he set out to to be the one to write one? Absolutely. I mean, we, we say this all the time that history is decided by the winners. History is just told by the winners. Um, and when you're not a person of privilege, a person of power, which black people were not so much in the 20th century and, and really hardly are at all today, it you have to own those stories. And now that he has a privilege in 2023, 2022, 2024 to, to retake that narrative, he did it. And um, I, I think black Americans should really be proud of this work because it digs heavily into the very specific details of how they were involved. Hmm. And you spoke to him about how um, history is taught about race to younger generations. Yes, it's it, it's a thing where, you know, as a black man, uh, Matthew F. Delmont and, and his you know, he's got kids and he talks about how in modern day there are people who want to combat how history is taught. There are people who want to kind of you know alter the way history is taught in schools and they want to censor certain books and he says it's scary as a historian to have these processes of how to how to write history being shoved aside because people think a topic is is too tough or um, people don't want racism to be taught to their kids but as he says for kids of color or parents with kids of color you don't have a choice when you're a person of color in this country, you learn about it from firsthand experience. And he says other people should understand that because it's something that children of color have to deal with, people um, who aren't in that world should have to learn about it as well to understand that shared experience. Hmm. And, and, and if we may, I, I do want to share a clip from his book because he really describes a pretty horrific situation that happened in World War II. Let's hear it. To make matters worse, German POWs now joined white American troops in the whites only section of the mess hall. Across the country, and especially in the South, where the majority of Nazi prisoners were held, black troops reported that these Germans were allowed to ride buses and trains, use latrines, and eat in the cafeteria alongside white Americans. White soldiers and civilians treated Nazis, who only weeks earlier had been fighting against the Allies and trying to kill Americans, with more respect than black troops who served their country. Seeing white Americans being so friendly with German POWs was perhaps the clearest evidence that Jim Crow segregation and the Nazis' mass or race theory were two sides of the same coin. So it's horrific stories like that that you'll hear in Half American. Right. Well, I want to go 
back to Martha's Vineyard yes. to talk about Charlene Hunter Galt, about her Lifetime Achievement Award for her work as a longtime journalist. So, what yeah. kind of stories earned this honor? So she's uh, a yeah, she's got bylines in CNN. PBS, NPR, uh, New York Times. You know, I, I said to her, you know, Charlene, because she's she's someone who, you know, focused on telling the stories of Black people around the world. She had beats in Harlem, and she was the first bureau chief in Harlem in New York uh, for the New York Times, uh, focusing in Atlanta, but even in Africa. She spent, you know, traveling around Africa telling stories of uh, of those lived experiences. You know, she she dedicated her life to people of color, particularly Black people, and. That's my beat here at IdeaStream covering issues of race and diversity. So to meet someone like Charlene Hunter Galt and who paved the way for people like me, it was like meeting the Rolling Stones. It was like meeting mm. Beyonce. I mean, it was like she's That's a rock when you were star. Starstruck. This is when I was <laughs> starstruck. This is the moment where I was like, holy cow. Yeah, I, I, for, I mean, for good reason. I'm absolutely in awe. So she's such a big deal. But the thing about it, she's also a history maker herself yeah. because in 1963, her and her high school classmate, then college classmate, Hamilton Holmes, became the first black graduates at the University of Georgia. So those two were responsible for segregating or desegregating the University of Georgia. I want to hear this clip from the documentary uh, where she's talking about her passion for this. I'm very frustrated with this move to stifle, let's put it that way, so much of our history. Because it's what has kept people like myself and Hamilton Holmes and so many others helped us to realize our dreams. And when you take those things out of our history, you move, you, you are attempting, not, I don't think being successful, but you are attempting to remove our armor because our history is our armor. You know, people got to fight to keep these stories alive. And she spent decades, an entire lifetime doing that. So it's easy to be proud of Charlene Hunter Gold. Right. And we have a few minutes left. So, of course, I we teased it yes. at the very beginning. We want to talk about Saeed Jones. Uh, he won um, the Poetry Prize for his collection called Alive at the End of the World. Um, and we mentioned that he has a you know big personality. He lives right here in Ohio. Tell us what meeting him was like. He's the king of cool, man. He's <laughs> he's uh, grew up in the American South, spent most most of his adult life living in New York. Now he just lives in Columbus because he thinks it's a cool place. He's a writer, you know, a poet, uh, spent some time working as a journalist in the past and he's got a you know he's a podcaster he's someone who's relied on for social commentary um and you know he he's such, does such a good job of it and this book he titled alive at the end of the world is pretty neat because it's basically this collection where he talks about that this is this is what the experience is like as a queer black man in america where people want to appreciate you and show love for you but they want to steal from you they they they, they you can't be loved without being hated at the same time. And that's what this collection is really there to illustrate and show. And to call it alive at the end of the world is to say, here we are fighting for our rights, fighting for equality, but also it feels like the world's ending a little bit, like we're mm -hmm. never really getting there. We have you know, a destruction of the earth and the climate and the, um, the economy and all these things. And he just feels like if you fight for these things, the prize is to be alive at the end of the world. Yeah, so, well, it, let's, let's hear an excerpt. When Little Richard said, if Elvis is the king of rock and roll, I'm the queen, he wasn't being cute or sassy. He was correcting the historical record and demanding equity that he never received. In America, one way to suffer a death before you die is for people to applaud you even as they steal from you. So There's what he's a statement on gender there, but he's also saying, I should be held at the same level. If we're going to create a hierarchy, don't put Elvis above me and the many other black artists, by the way, that Elvis stole from. Like, at best, he's my peer, but frankly, he's he's my protege. So what he's talking about there is cultural appropriation, this idea that these black artists throughout time created these great pieces of work and they were either recreated or watered down by other white artists who made even more money off of that creation. So, you know, he talks about a, a whole a whole long list of his black heroes and how they were affected by cultural appropriation. Hmm. Well, like I said, we have just about a minute, but I, I did want to ask you, Gabe, what in your mind, you worked on this for so long, what do you want people to take away from this documentary? 
I want people to take away the fact that these are stories, and you know, the Anisfield Wolf Book Awards exists for a reason. It exists to highlight these stories that are so often neglected. We can talk about Alive at the End of the World and how these are stories about these black artists through time that people may not really realize or know about. Half American is a history of World War II veterans that were neglected and weren't told. Charlotte Hunter Gall spent a career yeah. trying to fight for these stories, and now they have a chance to be honored, and I hope that people take a chance to take seriously the fact that these are stories that deserve to be told and deserve to be honored. Well, thanks so much, Gabriel Kramer, for coming here today to talk about this, and you with producer Natalia Garcia produced the documentary on the 88th annual Innisfield Wolf Book Awards. And it's on tonight, WVIZ at 8 o'clock. Yes, yes. You stole my next line here, Gabe. Yes. Thank you. Our long program tonight at 8 on WVIZ PBS, and you can stream it online on IdeaStream's website or PBS Passport. Thanks so much, Gabe. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break here, but when we come back, we're going to talk about food insecurity in Star County. Stick with us. You're with the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Anna Huntsman, in for Jenny, Jenny Hamill today. Thanks for being with us this hour. Food insecurity has been a growing concern nationwide and here in Ohio. A new report in 2023 from the U.S. Department of Agriculture found a severe increase in those facing hunger due to inflation and an end to increased funding for social safety net programs. A 2023 assessment from the Stark County Community Action Agency found over 40,000 people experienced food insecurity in 2021. That's the latest data available. But local organizations are stepping in to help help meet the need by operating food pantries and grocery stores for low-income residents. Today, we'll discuss the state of food insecurity in Stark County and the work of these nonprofits. And this is an idea, by the way, that came to us from listener Ryan when we asked for ideas to cover in 2024. Joining me in studio today, we have Douglas Colmery. He's the Food Justice Development Director at Stark Fresh, a Canton nonprofit aimed at tackling hunger and poverty across Stark County. Thanks so much for being here. Good morning. Thank you for having us. We also have two guests by phone. We have Don Ackerman, lead pastor at Crossroads United Methodist Church and executive director of Canton for All People. Welcome, Don. Morning. Glad to be here. By the way, Don, I grew up in Canton and sang in the choir there for a few years back when I was in high school. So great to talk to you. Oh, that's amazing. (laughs) We also have Stephanie Sweeney, executive director of Stark County Hunger Task Force. Thanks for calling. Thank you so much for having us. Have you faced challenges with hunger? Are you struggling to afford your groceries due to high prices? What kind of assistance benefited you? Tell us your story at 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Okay, Don, let's start with you. What led to your organization, Canton for All People, being formed and this focus on food insecurity? Canton for All People was really formed by this idea that Alexander Den Heyer has a quote that says, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. Um, While food insecurity is something we addressed, we were set to address improving the quality of life for the residents of downtown Canton. We do that through affordable housing, but obviously we also do that through food insecurity programs. We operate two fresh markets in the city. Uh, We feed about a third of the city of Canton every year. Almost 30,000 unique individuals come through about three times a year. And then our thing we're most excited about was this year in one month, we are opening a grocery store on the southeast side of Canton, a neighborhood that has not had a grocery store since the early 70s. Wow. Yeah. The southeast side, and I know there are several census tracts that have been labeled as persistently poor for decades. Um, So it's really great that you're able to help meet this need. Was this started um, because of these persistent problems? Did COVID have anything to do with it? Talk about that. Well, I think COVID had something. I mean, so truly in Stark County and in Canton in general, we have some pretty troubling statistics and that we're fourth in the nation for childhood poverty and that there was this need. But moreover, but we felt like we had the assets, the community-based organizations, the residents that could put together a great idea to actually do something about it. So instead of saying, oh, well, woe is us, and we have all these challenges like a lot of other Rust Belt cities, we have some really great people in Canton, Ohio, who came together to put their heads together to create some really creative collaborations to bring a grocery store and, and you know, end this legacy of redlining on the southeast side to put a grocery store down there 
but then also offer food in areas where uh, residents were facing those pers- kinds of persistent challenges. Hmm. Doug, let's talk about the model at Stark Fresh. So how is this different than a food bank? We are not a food bank. We actually sell the food. Hmm. We always have some items available for free. So if people come in and they are truly uh, and they're they're hungry and they can't afford food, um, they can at least get something um, that we do have available. But we are a full-on grocery store, small store. Um, sort of think back to the old-style neighborhood groceries. Um, we have a store in downtown Canton and also a second store that opened in October in Alliance. And in both cases, we are either right on, we're, we're essentially on the edge of downtown. Uh, neighborhoods that, as, uh, as pa- Pastor just said, um, these are areas that have not had proper groceries for decades. Um, as the small stores were gobbled up and put out of business by the bigger and bigger chains in the 60s, 70s, and so on, neighborhoods became deprived uh, of any sort of access to proper food. Uh, we use the term food apartheid. Um, some places, uh, you, you know, you, you'll hear food desert all the time. Right. But if you think about it, a desert's natural, whereas apartheid is a discriminatory situation and it's something that is created by people. So in the interest of bigger and bigger stores and places that are accessible by car as opposed to people in neighborhoods who can walk to their stores, um, you know, neighborhoods got completely isolated um, from any kind of fresh food. So we offer uh, in the stores, and again, we are, you know, we're not a food bank, but we do offer a wide variety of foods, healthy foods, good quality foods, and we do it at a fair price. Hmm. Um, In addition, uh, we are the only um, store in the county that offers a discount on SNAP purchases and EBT in that in our Canton store, if someone is using their EBT card, all produce, uh, all fruit and veg is essentially 50% off. Um, and in Alliance, we match not just on the produce, but we match on all purchases. So if someone is um, you know, buying $10 worth of groceries on their SNAP card, they are charged $5. Mm. And that is something that really, really helps stretch people's food dollars. And what do you hear from residents who are able to use this service? And I'd, I almost have to imagine that maybe you hear from people who were there when the grocery stores were closing and have maybe experienced this. What what do you hear? They love it. And we our demographic, um, where we're located in Canton specifically, the median age is just under 60 years old. So we do have a lot of older people in the neighborhood. And the benefits that people were getting prior to COVID in terms of um, dollars on their SNAP card, in many, many, many cases, under $20 a month. So that doesn't really go very far. Sure. If we can double it, you know, it really helps people's lives. Stephanie, I want to bring you into the conversation. You're with the Stark County Hunger Task Force. How do you determine what type of food you provide to people who are in need? We try to provide as many of the basic pantry essentials Uh, like spaghetti, canned fruit, canned vegetables, uh, making sure we have lots of proteins. Um, But we also want to get guidance from our clients and what they like and what their needs are for their families. So we do survey our clients on a regular basis. Uh, Sometimes we can provide that, sometimes we can't. It just depends on what's available. Uh, Much like when you go to the grocery store to purchase food and you're looking for something and it's, it's not there. Uh, we have trouble sourcing food on occasion as well. But we really do like to get input from our clients at the end of the day. Uh, that's who we are serving. And that has really been a benefit to us. So we do try to provide a wide variety of items and provide items that people can actually cook meals with. Uh, we provide recipes when we get items as well so they know how to cook those items that we're providing in our pantry. 
866-578-0903 is the number to call if you'd like to join the conversation. Perhaps share a story if you faced challenges with hunger or perhaps you work with uh, these communities and, and uh, what kind of assistance has benefited you. Are you struggling to afford your groceries due to high prices? Give us a call, 866-578-0903, or send us an email at soi at ideastream.org. Uh, Stephanie, I, I did want to ask, uh, do you, how do you determine how much a person gets uh, when you're doing this outreach? Sure. So what's different about our organization is, yes, we do have a pantry that we run out of the Ken Weber Community Campus at Goodwill, but we also have a network of 35 pantries across Stark County that we provide logistical and financial support to. So they have kind of their own way of operating and they operate what is the best for the specific community and neighborhood that they're serving. So I won't speak to exactly what uh, what they are, are doing, um, but we have a system in our pantry at the Goodwill campus where we do distribute based off of household size. Uh, so our household size is Four would be about the average of the families that are coming through our pantry. Um, our pantry does serve quite a number of individuals um, each year. Um, you know, the numbers for 2023 were made available just a couple weeks ago, and our pantry at the Goodwill campus alone uh, served over 47,000 individuals. Um, it was the largest that we've ever seen before um, from all the data I've been able to um, to access over over the years hmm. uh, but we do based off of how much food that we have in stock at that given time but we do want to make sure that every family is leaving <coughs> our pantry with enough food for their household um, our goal is to provide a week's worth of food for each visit when people are going through and people can go through our pantry uh, twice a month our network pantries they all have their um their own parameters of how many times they can go through their pantry. But our pantry here at the Goodwill campus, you can go through twice a month. Got it. I have a similar question about Stark Fresh. And uh, we actually have Tom Phillips, the executive director of Stark Fresh, on the phone here. So, hi, Tom. Welcome to the Sound of Ideas. Thanks for having me. Tom, how does Stark Fresh identify what areas in the county to focus on? And what are kind of the factors that you might consider if prioritizing one or the other? Or what are you really looking for? Well, as uh, Don had mentioned, you know, it's an area of uh, great need all over the place. So trying to figure out the best places to go um, is certainly, um, I'm sure there's a science to it, um, but it's something that I think all of us that are in the trenches here are figuring out together. Um, for us, uh, an easy way that we've used to identify uh, some areas of need um, and where people, uh, a good location for a store would be our, we used to have a mobile grocery market that we operated that would go throughout the county and and deliver fresh uh, vegetables and uh, regular groceries to people with mobility challenges or low income. Um, when we started opening grocery stores, that's transitioned, um, and this year we're opening up um, in about a month um, online ordering um, for our online grocery store and then deliver right to people's homes with no no fees like you'd have with a regular DoorDash or Instacart or any of those things, hmm. uh, which basically takes place of that mobile. Um, but yeah, it's uh, places where people, there's lots of census tracts where there's neighborhoods that just have not much of anything, right? Um, not They don't have car, um, easily accessible cars. They may not have a, a great bus route. Um, and if you can place a store in a location where people can walk to it every couple of days and it becomes uh, a different part of the community instead of just a transactional extracting place where people go and spend their money and then the money comes out of that neighborhood. It becomes a, a real um, part of that community where people are coming in and they're talking and you get to know each other's lives. That has additional benefits beyond just making sure that people have food. Um, and so... There's, there's no shortage of places to look um, for us opening stores. We need strong partners to help us um, with some of the logistics 
lots of building stock here in Stark County that we can repurpose. Mm. Um, we don't have to spend a million dollars to to renovate a place. We could just spend a couple hundred thousand and um, put a store in a neighborhood. Mm. Don, uh, with Canton for All People, I want to bring you back into the conversation. You mentioned before that, you know, this was a group that wanted to really get something done about this persistent problem of food insecurity, but also, you know, poverty in Canton and across Stark County. So what are some of the different programs that Canton for All People offers uh, for people facing hunger? So we are hyper-focused on Canton, been predominantly in our Greater Shore neighborhood, which is our near northwest end, where we've had persistent crime and um, other, uh, mainly housing challenges. We and then we also focus on a project that we felt like was the lowest hanging fruit in the city was the fact that our southeast end had not had a grocery store, and so it became the question: you know, could we put together a team of people to renovate a vacant facility on the southeast side? to create uh, a neighborhood grocery once again. And like I mentioned, it has not had one since the early 70s. And it took us the better part of uh, three years and two and a half million dollars to do it. But uh, here in February, we are proud to open up the Southeast Market Plaza, which will be home to a a doctor's office staffed by My Community Health uh, and run with nurses in that uh, who are from the neighborhood. And then also a grocery store uh, that would be housed by Summers Market out of Hartville. And one of the best things, like Tom just mentioned, is Summers Market's a local Stark County grocery store. They're not one of the big guys. And we've gone to many of them who could not make the numbers work and told us persistently that the economics could not work in that neighborhood. But when you find good local partners who are interested in doing something like this in the neighborhood, like a summer's market, like Tom Phillips at Stark Fresh, we begin to see these possibilities and we're able to make that happen. Additionally, Canton for All People, we extend this because when we were, we had done tens of thousands of food deliveries and COVID and we were finding out that many people didn't have kitchens, good kitchens and homes to even cook this food in to begin with, which became a challenge. And that led to us creating an affordable housing effort, which now creates, you know, we've renovated 13 houses in the Shorp neighborhood. And then next year, we'll be building 10 new houses in the Shorp neighborhood, six rehabs, and we continue to help families move uh, to a more holistic financial picture for their lives and living in healthy homes, as well as having healthy food. Hmm. 866-578-0903 is the number to call if you would like to join the conversation we're having about food insecurity, specifically in Stark County. But obviously, we know the the numbers and the problem is has been increasingly worse across Ohio. We did get an email from Kevin, who's wondering if the Akron Canton Food Bank branch that opened fairly recently in Stark County has had an impact on food insecurity. Stephanie, uh, any any word on this? So like I mentioned, we do have a whole network of food pantries. Uh, They cover every corner of Stark County. And obviously we're in communication with them on a regular basis. And I can say that the convenience of being able to go right in your backyard to pick up your food from the Akron Cant Regional Food Bank. So if people are not familiar, uh, most of the food pantries in Stark County, they do purchase a portion of their food from the Akron Canton Regional Food Bank. Uh, Some food is made available for free as well, um, which is always fantastic to see. Uh, But the convenience of being able to go to to Canton instead of going up to Akron to pick up that food for your pantry has been amazing. Um, Pantries are able to do more pickups in a week if needed to. So overall, it has been able to impact the amount of food that we can distribute in our pantries. Got it. We also got an email from Wendy, uh, who says she's part of the Stark Fresh Racial Justice Group. She says, I love the store in Canton. It's tiny, but the food there is varied, has great prices, and there's plenty of fresh produce, and there are interesting snacks and other nutritious side dishes in smaller packages. So, Doug, you got a shout out there for, for Stark Fresh. And so it's interesting that it's not just, you know, the basic food. It's also you get to have some, I don't know, maybe fun snacks to pick up. But I do want to talk about the mobile truck of Stark Fresh. We haven't really talked about that too much yet. So talk about this model, Doug, and how it differs from a traditional food bank. Well, um, our mobile is morphing, as Tom mentioned. Uh, Within the next three weeks, we will kick off our delivery service. The mobile has been going out for the last 10 years, and we have served um, tens of thousands of people 
We went mostly to senior facilities and into some lower income neighborhoods, um, health departments, hospitals, and so on through the years. Um, and it's a converted hotel shuttle that people could actually walk on, walk through, do their shopping. Um, the downside of it was that it was only once a week at a, at a given location. We hit about 20 locations a week. Uh, but with our new delivery service, people can call and get same-day delivery. And you don't have to wait you know, until next Wednesday when the mobile's going to be at your, at your high-rise again. So, Got but, it. Um, it was the first mobile in the region, and it was very successful. People loved it. Um, but now um, we think it's going to be a uh, better service to people to have access to our full inventory. Hmm. You know, the mobile was a good-sized vehicle, but of course you're limited to what you can, can carry on board at any given time. So people will now have access to our full inventory, be able to order and have it delivered same day to their to their home. And I just have to say, I, th- I can't remember if it was last year or two years ago, I remember reporting on the catalytic converters being stolen, yes. which was, I remember when I did this story, that was so devastating because it was a once a week type of thing. So this was a really big problem, obviously, at the, at the time, it, it's a big problem, but just that fact that it was only once a week. So it's wonderful to see that it's expanding so much now. And speaking of transportation, I do want to talk about those other barriers um, to people's access to food. Don, I know you're doing a lot of work around affordable housing. So can you explain how that and other non-food related efforts can impact someone who's struggling with hunger? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the way, so we actually operate two pantries in the city, and we call ours fresh markets. And the way that we try to overcome, say, transportation barriers, um, and we talked about housing and those things, is that our pantries we felt like one needed to provide healthy food, and two they needed to be accessible and open in the neighborhoods that needed them most. And so we operate one on 6th and Shore Avenue. We operate another one up on Harmont and 35th. Um, And those places are open four days a week, 11 to 4 p.m. So folks can just walk in and shop. And we bring about, you know, eight to 10 tons of produce into those stores every single day. And what we see in operating those places in those neighborhoods, folks are able just to walk down and get that additional assistance. But most importantly, we'd be remiss without saying is that most folks, almost 75% of our downtown neighborhoods are cost burdened or severely cost burdened in their housing. And what that means is folks have a whole lot less money to spend on their food at the end of the day, knowing that they are spending almost 75% of their income in housing. And then on top of that, due to housing assessments and studies that we've done in these neighborhoods, Almost two thirds of these houses where the average price of rent is $810 a month is what we would consider substandard housing. So people are cost burdened in their rent, but then they're also paying for the privilege to live in some really, really, really terrible conditions in in many cases. I see. Stephanie, what are the significant challenges that organizations like yours face in keeping all these helpful efforts going and how do you pursue solutions? So our, there's one program I didn't get to mention yet that has been the most challenging for us to grow, and uh, that is our Backpack for Kids program. Um, so child hunger, you know, hunger in general is a, you know, a big issue in our community that we're, we're all here on the call trying to address, uh, but child hunger in Canton City in particular um, has been, you know, really kind of on everybody's radar here in Star County. And our backpack program is uh, 2,000 strong right now. So we are serving 2,000 children each and every week. Uh, backpack program is a weekend meal program where we're providing two breakfasts, two lunches, and two or three snacks uh, to children all across Stark County. Um, we do work through um, the school districts and the schools to provide those backpacks. Uh, but one of our biggest barriers with that program in particular is the cost of food. And if you look at how many backpacks that we're providing every week and how many are going on across the county, 
each week. Um, I know that Canton Ruffle People supports a, a backpack program as well at one of our Canton schools, uh, but there's not a lot of other programs that are able to step up and provide these uh, these bags of food for these kids because the cost is tremendous. Uh, for that particular program, there is not as much of food available for us um, at the Akron Cant Regional Food Bank because it's very specific. It's all individual sized items that are kid friendly, that are easy to make, that are accessible to them. So being able to keep up with that, the cost of providing food um, each and every week um, to our backpack students, um, I would say would be the biggest challenge for us. Um, mm. so when it comes to solutions, we are very lucky to have so much support from the community, uh, but you know, you have to be constantly looking for new sources of income to be able to provide those backpacks. And we're actually physically running out of space as well um, here at the, the Goodwill campus. Uh, so our hope is to be able to potentially mentor some other organizations that might be interested to start Backpack for Kids programs. Got it. Doug, we mentioned the big expansion uh, of the mobile truck. Anything else in 30 seconds uh, that you're excited for this year with Stark Fresh? Very much. Um, again, the Alliance store just opened in October. We have at our Food Justice campus the only shared use commercial kitchen that is registered and licensed in the county. Um, we have about 18 different small businesses using the kitchen. Got it. We have fostered and developed multiple small businesses. We have lots of educational opportunities. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to end it there. We are Thank so you. tight. Thank you so much, Doug. Thanks so much to Don Ackerman of Canton for All People and Stephanie Sweeney. I'm Anna Huntsman in today for Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for listening.